Hey everyone, I am joined by Roman, aka Der Bauer. So the topics for discussion today, it's been a few years since we've gotten to do some of these videos and they're always really fun because we don't plan anything. And yeah. it just ends up being the audience gets to watch us hang out. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what it is. So this is stuff you're doing. Yes. Where do you want to start with? I would start stuff? with uh, the AM5 direct eye stuff. So that's something I showed briefly on my channel already, especially like this. So we started looking into the, the AM5 heat better, uh -huh. even though AMD says it's uh, perfect and fine and yeah. 95 degrees is awesome. It's great. Um, I kind of do not agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why we looked into like making an upgrade heat better. Mm. So that was this one. Before that, this video is brought to you by Deepcool and the new Zero Dark series of AK620 and AK400 CPU coolers. We previously reviewed the AK620 and AK400 and found them to be among a new crop of extremely competitive coolers for the price. The new Zero Dark and Zero Dark Plus variations move out to a blackout color design with blackout FDB fans. The heat sinks otherwise have the same characteristics as those that we tested previously and found to be well performing, just with a fresh new look. Learn more at the link in the description below. And uh, we actually had a different version prior to that, which was a little bit smaller, but um, this kind of is like a, a mix out of a contact frame and a heat spatter. Okay. So it like pushes down the CPU into the socket with a like right amount of force if you tighten it down to the board. So okay. it's kind of easy to use. So socket's down on the CPU like that? Yeah. Direct eye? Yeah, like you yeah. D-Lid basically yeah. mount this. Yeah. And then uh, is the Z height, does that end up being the same? Yeah, this, like, the, this, the Z height is actually a little bit lower. It's okay. like 1.1 1, 1. 1 millimeter lower. Okay, I'm um, guessing that's part of the performance. Gain. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we thought about keeping it the same because um, originally when we made our direct dive frame, we had a lot of feedback from you guys that um, it's performing well on custom motor blocks like the Corsair block mm -hmm. or like the EK block, mm -hmm. but that you cannot use it on monoblocks because monoblocks are like, they have their set C height, right? Right. And also AIOs were a big problem because uh, an AIO is designed that you have a heat spreader that already spread the heat and mm -hmm. then because the pump is so slow and no flow rate. So big hotspot would cause bad temperatures. And that's what we saw. We had people using our direct dive frame that basically had no improvement. Okay. And yeah. The thing is, originally we made the direct dive frame so it can be used on like uh, <laughs> custom water cooling. It's okay. The table yeah. is the only thing that got hurt. <laughs> it's yeah. very thick metal. The thing is about the, the contact frame, you know, um, I totally agree with your review that actually ours is quite complicated mm. to, to, to mount. The thing is when we originally ma made it, we made it just for LN2 overclocking guys. Right. Because we, we never expected that this would become a mainstream product. Yeah. That's also why we like didn't keep the like the cost aspect in mind that much because we're like I mean they don't care if they pay like forty or thirty euros. Uh, you're euro talking and, about uh, people who buy like four hundred dollar LN2 pots, yes. right? Yeah, and they go through hundreds yeah. of dollars of liquid nitrogen, and, for, and they yeah. would like to be able to like fine tune pressure so mm. they can check different memory clocks and stuff. Whereas the the average user like the thermal right um, solution was actually better mm. like or like easier to use for the normal consumer. We made an updated ver version actually. So the if you buy the 13th gen frame mm. now, um, I'm not actually not sure if that's already launched, but Should we cut uh, that part of the video? no, that's totally fine, totally <laughs> okay. fine. Uh, but if that comes to the market, I'm not sure if it's already in the market, but we made, we made it like, like two months or three months ago. This is like, um, this, this is like, <laughs> I, I'm too successful. I, I don't know if my products are even available. No, you where know, is all this money coming from? <laughs> no, that's certainly not the case. I know where all my money is going into machines and stuff. Yeah. Well, you're, uh, this is something we can do at a different time, but yeah. to build, might as well build on it because we're in one of the Steve and Roman meander through absolutely no plan whatsoever yeah. conversation. But one of your things you were working on, you were telling me, is uh, trying to build out factories in Germany. Is yeah, that right? so we actually we acquired a new building. Uh, it has like two thousand something square meters. Okay, um, I don't know what meters are, but anyway, uh, it's the the proper unit. Okay, uh, uh, it's <laughs> it, it's big. Yeah, it's big. okay, that I understand. <laughs> a lot of rooms. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> we have space right now for about like sixty people. Okay, uh, and that is a lot. Like right, like right now we have about thirty people working, mm. and uh, we want to hire uh, like 10, 15 more this year. Um, because yeah, we were moving the the paste production to to Germany, mm. 
Um, I mean, I don't want to discuss politics, but uh, sure, I mean, sure, sure. globally, you know, you, you can, can, you can you figure why. that, that yeah. things are getting spicy or could get spicy. Right. And it's getting right. also for us, it's, um, it's getting more and more complicated just even to if we import and export like raw materials, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty strange. Like uh, if just for just an example, yeah. if I export a uh, metal alloy from China, uh -huh. then there's no problem. But if okay. I, I want to export the, the raw materials, uh -huh. that's a big problem. It makes, okay. it makes no sense. Okay, well, we, uh, yeah, we deal with similar stuff. And yeah. I mean, one of the things, you start eliminating, like, so cost goes up in other places, but you can at least eliminate, say, ocean freight or something like that, plus yeah. the lead time. And a kind of boring topic for everyone, but <laughs> I think yeah. it's interesting. But yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so that's so anyway, what he's saying is buy his thermal paste because he needs to make a building out of it. Uh, yeah, and we'll I mean, hopefully do a tour once you're yeah, ready. That we talked about that, so that could be very interesting. Yeah. We're actually reserving that for you to okay. not show everything up front uh, because yeah. we have a lot of very interesting machines. So you can see, you can come see how like paste is developed, cool. like how we make it. Um, like how we fill it into syringes, like uh, like automated machines and yeah. stuff. So uh, that's very interesting. Also, like an analysis stuff is also quite interesting. Um, like looking into material science. And, okay, uh, that'll be yeah. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, so that's yeah. that's where the money goes to, like right. buying all these machines. How about getting back to this stuff? So yeah. we're talking about this plate. Um, do you want to get into the water cooling thing right away? I mean, yeah. I mean, what what I find like personally quite interesting is um, actually those surfaces. You can see that this inner surface is like this portion right here looks different from the rest. This is because like this is done with a normal end mill, like a normal steel mill. Okay. And this is done with a, a diamond mill. Okay. So it's like a, a it's in Germany it's called MKD. It's like a, one just one piece of diamond. So it's extremely hard. It has a very defined um, edge for cutting. And so does the machine just have basically multiple bits or mills in it, or it's yeah, different yeah. machines? Yeah, it can. No, it's, it's the same machine, but okay. you can change the bits. Okay. And it's the same for this one, even though, I mean, this has been used quite a lot of times. But you can see that the surface is extremely uh, like a mirror. Right. It's like a mirror, mirror finish. So the, the surface quality you can achieve with diamond milling. It's amazing and the, the tool we had to make or like, like we had to go to a company mm. and tell them we need a tool that can have those diamond cutters in it and have this size and i think just for the tool we paid seven thousand euro Jeez. just for okay. a tool to make this surface right and then people are asking me why this is 30 euro <laughs> and is that is that yeah. for one machine basically yeah. one tool one tool yeah. for one machine yeah um, luckily we can reuse it for like some other surfaces but how how yeah. much does uh manufacturing time versus material cost play into the uh, for us it's a uh, perfect 50 50. okay so when when i do the calculation um of this piece uh, let's say that the copper part maybe is like seven euro mm. then i will also have like seven euro of manufacturing cost okay that's pretty much like a rule of thumb for us right um, for, for and you have all the stuff that's harder to account for like uh, providing better customer support, packaging, yeah. um, possible overhead for RMAs or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So the the worst for us is to calculate development cost. Oh, it's because impossible. Like, I mean, the you know what I've found works. Huh? Uh, I value my time at zero dollars per hour, and then all of the calculations are easy. Yeah, we're as as, yeah, as yeah, as long yeah. as you do it that way. Yeah, we we <laughs> actually go, well. I hope I sell yeah. it long enough. To profit, and then that'll be what my time was worth. Yeah, like right now we do the same. We just calculate the machining cost, right, and like the material and the tools and everything, and like completely neglect development. Yeah, oh, which yeah. is like from like yeah, it's it works when you're yeah. the guy doing a lot of it. I think yeah, it, when yeah. you become a big company, or if if there are big companies that have to hire teams for it, it's much more calculated. I, I think. hope I will never reach that stage. I also like, don't want to reach uh, that stage. Like, I, I, I feel comfortable having up to like 50 people maybe. That's more than me, than I would feel uh, comfortable with, but. You grow into it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But that is that is important though, if you want to scale. Yeah, so, um, you know, yeah, so water cooling stuff. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to show is basically uh, also some of these prototypes. So these were some of the, the early samples we made of the, the AM5 direct air cooler. Uh -huh. And um, the way we do it is usually just trial and error because you can theoretically simulate it. But from my experience, it's a lot easier and faster that you just make like 20 designs. Okay. 
and you just try all of them. Sure. And then it, it takes you like a week maybe. Well, also, if you simulate it, you're going to have to do real testing anyway yes. at some point. So you yeah. might as well just do the testing. So, so we just uh, we made like a lot of different versions of that. And those are like two extremes. Like that is... Uh, this looks much finer. Yes. So that's like a 0 0.5 millimeter cut. Okay. And that's like 0 0.2 millimeter wow. cut. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's, um, you can go down to like 0 0.15. But <laughs> you don't want to do it. It's like a very critical process. Yeah. Uh, because if you cut like, I don't know, like 40 of those lanes and then your your saw breaks, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have, I guess you would have to basically throw away that block. Yes. Like melt it down or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's why, that's why there is a trade-off between having like the best cooling, yeah. but also keeping in mind that people, not everybody uses high pump speed. That's, yeah. that's one thing, because you, if you want to use that one, like very fine one with like 100% pump speed, it's going to perform the best. It's going to perform better than this one, but we did not use it for, for mass production because right. I, I'm, I was testing a 25% uh, pump speed to make okay. sure that even like a quiet it user... Still, it can still push past the impedance. Yeah. 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 What, which, what did you end up going with? Either of these two or a different one? Entirely? In between. So we, okay. um, we went with 0 0.5 millimeter uh, like cut. Okay. And the distance between is 0 0.28. Wow. So okay. Yeah. Quite, okay. Sp quite specific. But then also, it's not only this, but it's also the height that matters. Mm. So especially on direct dye, the distance between this surface and like the bottom of the cut is usually quite a lot thicker than on a, on a normal water block mm. because you you have to have something like a heat spreader uh, otherwise the, the thermal density is just too much okay it's too much it was too much last night i said this is too much this morning i said this is too much and now i realize it's too much and you will perform worse got yeah. it um let's talk about so on these uh, i'm sure someone's already typed a comment you can see the <laughs> you can see the uh, imprint we'll call it from a previous liquid metal application yeah. And we're talking about uh, going to something like, say, a nickel plating. Can you help explain to me again, I haven't covered this topic in years, but why does this happen on, say, this one, and, and why do you end up better off over here? So, I mean, the, the liquid metal basically contains at least of two, uh, two metal components, it's mm. gallium and indium. Mm. You can add tin. To kind is of that Gallenstan? Red, yeah, yeah Gallenstan is like the, the a trade name of a specific composition oh, okay. mm. that has like the lowest melting point that's used like in ther thermometers. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, tin is actually worse for th the thermal conductivity and um, topic for later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you use like gallium and indium, gallium is actually quite corrosive metal. Okay. It's, it's corrosive, especially to aluminium. Mm. Uh, it's doing this grain boundary diffusion, it's called. Mm. So it's going through the aluminium grains and then it's basically falling apart. Okay. Um, it's different on, on the, the copper. It's not going into the grains, but it's forming an alloy on, on the top. So yeah. it's, it's not directly corrosion, but the, the thing is because it's uh, like forming an alloy, the composition will be different of the remaining liquid metal. That's why after a long time period, right. it will look like it dried out, but it mm -hmm. actually formed like an alloy with the copper and then the remaining uh, liquid metal is a different okay. composition and can be hard at room temperature. That's why it will look like it dried out. Right. Yeah. So then do you avoid that entirely with nickel plated? Not entirely, okay. because even on the nickel, if you like, if you take... I guess an, the IHSs are nickel yes, plated. But if you, if you lose, use like an SEM and do a cross section, um, then you will see that even on the nickel, mm. it will form an alloy like on the very top, okay. but only to a very small degree, I very, see. very small degree. Uh, that's why usually this is used like as a diffusion barrier. It's also um, why applied under an IHS, uh, and I don't know how it interacts with like modern gold plated stuff, but, yeah. uh, but under at least nickel plated IHS to a dye, um, in the limited test we've done, we've seen pretty good longevity. Yeah. without necessarily needing to reapply. Uh, yeah. I don't know if gold is worth going over, if that changes at all. The, the, go the gold um, is usually done um, during the soldering process mm. because the indium sticks very well to it. Right. And it actually does the same on gallium, so it also helps to stick very well to it, but then again, um, it forms alloys. Right. So it changes uh, things again. It may look like it's oxidizing and uh, that's okay. something you don't want. Actually, that's maybe a good... Um, way to transition to this. Sure. Because the... Is this the pad? This oh, is, yeah. This Prodigy. is the pad. Um, 
quickly going to open this one. So it's like a graphene mm. uh, a based pad. Uh, graphite base pads have been around for, for a long time already. Yeah, what was the one I looked at? Was that an icy diamond? Yeah, icy diamond yeah. and uh, ice. Yeah. I yeah, we looked at icy diamond yeah. and, and we looked at. Uh, there were a couple others, and then in that roundup, we eventually did the carbonate pad, yes. which itself is also different. But yeah, so this one um, is graphene, and graphene, gra graphene and graphite are not that much different, mm. except for that graphene is like a it's like a two D uh, layer of um, of graphite. Okay, and it has like an amazing thermal conductivity in this in this planar Horizontal. direction, right? And the, um, the graphite pads are similar, so they have this like insane thermal conductivity in x and y directions. Mm. So, like on a table, if you would put it on, it would like perfectly even this out, which is nice for like a phone, for example, yeah. if you'd like have to spread the heat to the side. But for a CPU cooler, it actually doesn't make any sense because you have to go in z direction. The the best example yeah. I had of a uh, icy diamond pad when I, I eventually after we posted our video years ago, came into contact with an engineer. Uh, for McDonald's digital signage, he emailed us. Okay, okay. And he said, um, uh, so he his his job is to design thermal solutions for uh, outside digital signage, like screens, things that are in the sun all day, and yeah. display a menu. And um, so the explanation I got was that pads that distribute the heat load horizontally. Uh, Sorry. Uh. Asus is coming for me. <laughs> yeah, we, we hijacked uh, the Asus meeting room quickly, and it uh, uh, seems like they want to have it back, but they're not getting it back. <laughs> so get Vitaly filming me getting dragged out by Asus. <laughs> what he was telling me is that they use the pads that uh, specifically that spread horizontally efficiently because. Uh, they need to distribute the heat on as wide an area as possible because they're normally using large pieces of metal mm -hmm. across, say, a four foot, sorry, let's say like one and a half meter by one meter sign. Um, so you have all this surface area, but paste wasn't feasible for a lot of these applications because it just dries out. Yeah. So anyway, that was one of the use cases. But for a CPU, this doesn't really work as well because you, you don't have that much surface area and you need to get vertical fast, I guess. That's yeah. kind of where you were going with it. Yeah, so. exactly. So um, this is um, made for us by a Swedish company. Okay. Um, we've been working with uh, for the previous year and um, they are extremely experienced in uh, just this very specific type of product. Mm. Um, they've I think they've been researching this for like 10 years. And... Um, so what they basically did is um, they stacked a huge amount of those uh, 2D planar uh, graf graphene sheets. Okay. And then they... they uh, Stood them up? Yeah, okay. like 90 degree, and then they cut them. Cool. And like this baking and cutting process is uh, extremely difficult, especially because it's... Um, I mean, this is like 0.2%, uh, 0 0.2 millimeter uh, thick. So it's like... Yeah, percent is the imperial unit. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's, it's extremely thin. It's also very fragile, actually. That's the only downside that um, if you don't know this product and you don't know how to handle it, so if I like wiggle it around a little bit, it will just simply break apart. Right. Okay. Um, so you have to be kind of careful. The best application, what I would recommend this for, is either that you want to use and forget, like mm -hmm. you apply it and it has a very good performance. It's in line with good thermal pastes. Um, it will not beat liquid metal simply because of the, the height, it's mm. not possible, but it's still very good. And we tested this on even those direct dye coolers and you lose like six to seven degrees over liquid metal, okay. which I think is like the perfect trade-off. Like, okay, you lose six degrees, it's still like 20 degrees Celsius lower than the stock. So that's the yeah. thing, right? It's but like you, liquid yeah. metal is all, you're losing six degrees off of something that is already a massive improvement. So, yeah. Um, so and you will not have any hassle like right. liquid, liquid metal. Uh, but it sounds like because of the fr relative fragility of it, it's not the type of thing you should you should be like, I wonder if my pad is still okay, and then pull the cooler off and look. Yeah. Um, just carve on a little bit of that where it's 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 like reusable yeah. to an extent, uh, but once you start clamping down a lot. The thing yeah. is, um, most of these pads, 
theoretically, so let's say you compress them, you use them, if you heat them up, mm -hmm. especially the, gra the graphite pads do this very well. So you use like a, a heat gun, mm -hmm. you heat them up to like 300 degrees Celsius and they basically pop up. Oh. So you can reuse them. Interesting. Okay. So that's for graphite pads. For this, this does not work. Mm. Um, if you use it once and it's getting compressed, you press it in those tiny uh, like micro scratches or something. Right. Um, it will stay in there. And if you like open the cooler, yeah, you would have Might to use a new pad. Yeah. It's not reusable. Okay. Uh, well, it's reusable, but you will lose temperature. Right. If you do it. Right. And but from my perspective, that's amazing. Like we tested this for a year with like liquid uh, uh, with liquid nitrogen. Mm. It works extremely well for okay. extreme overclocking community. Uh, they don't have cracking anymore if they yeah. use it. And um, so is the, it sounds like the objective is fill a spot in the market between liquid metal and paste with yes. uh, using your own phrasing, but like set and forget type of thing. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Especially yeah. for the liquid metal application. If you used it, I know that it works most of the time, but sometimes depending what kind of materials you use it with, you might be unlucky. You right. might have something that looks like corrosion. Mm. And to avoid all of that, you can simply go for this, put it on there, and it will perform extremely well. Right. Because what I absolutely, I will, I would love to say that again, don't use paste on any kind of direct dye application. Okay. The power density is way too high for, for a normal paste. Mm. And you will have that something that looks like the, the pump out effect. I was going to ask, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we covered that in an old video. I'll link it below. Yeah, uh, so you can watch that. And to avoid this, this is like the perfect alternative. Yeah, yeah. you can't really pump it out with the uh, heat cycles. So yeah, we'll just say the same. Uh, how about moving over to this stuff? What's mm -hmm. going on here? So we have, in general, two designs. That is the, um, the AM5 direct dye cooler, which is um, called Micro. Mm. And that's the like the high-end RGB version. So it has an acrylic piece that also distributes the, the water. And it's mounted like that, so it replaces the, the AMD SAM. Okay. You clamp it down with those two screw, uh, those four screws. Yeah. You can screw it down all the way until the, the cooler hits the, the main board. So mm. it's quite easy to use. And after that, you simply put this back on and you're done. So okay. it's very simple, very easy to use, also um, quite tiny actually, yeah. Um, so base, I actually saw the video on that one, uh, but direct eye water block, I guess, is kind of yeah. the yeah. approach, yeah. Exactly, and then the, there's this like uh, lower cost version, which is this one. Uh, it's just using a POM top instead of the acrylic and okay. the aluminum one. And it's obviously also going to be, going to be nickel plated. That's just because this was one of the prototypes. Right. And what we did not show yet is uh, this version, which is going to be the Intel uh, direct dye water block. Mm. It's the same thing. So basically, we mimicked the, the imprint of the IHS okay. to push the CPU down into the socket and have good contact in the center at the same time. So it's the same thing as with the AM4 block, Got just it. Intel adaption. Um, cool. even, even this one should fit on here. Nice. Yeah. So That was a risky move. I'm glad it paid off. Yeah, me too. <laughs> because it's me who designed it. <laughs> I mean, in, in between, obviously, you make mistakes like one dimension, one millimeter off, and you're like, great, I have to do everything again. Oh, and also just uh, having multiple different samples and revisions and keeping yes. track of them. Yeah. You know what's the, what's the best? On this one, I made the mistake that I uh, flipped the inner oh, uh, the inner uh, structure of, uh, the, of the IHS. You can see that it has like those cutouts, yeah. those two for the SMDs. And when I made my first one, I made the mistake that I like rotated this by uh, 180 degrees, yeah. like by mistake. And when I put the cooler onto my CPU, I like crashed all the, <laughs> all the SMDs and the CPU was instantly dead. <laughs> I was like, yeah, nice, thank that's you. The, that, that's the part of the cost we were talking about earlier, the, the design and development cost you didn't account for. Yeah destroying products to test them. So. Yeah. We are adapting this into non-direct eye as well. So okay. we are now currently manufacturing a, a piece that's a little bit higher mm -hmm. and it will replace the ILM. And it's going to be like a contact frame with water block at the same time. Okay. So for people who want to use it on Intel, they can just move away the ILM. They don't have to buy a contact frame, which is bad for me. Mm. But um, they can buy this water block, which will be like 90, 90 euro, 90 dollar roughly. Sure. And instead of having to buy a contact frame as well, just get this one product and does it all together. Okay. Yeah. 
Got it. How about uh, this version of Wireview? Yeah, so we showed some versions before, and I think we never showed this. It's just ready right now. OK. And especially with all the 12-volt high power, I'm yeah, not sure yeah, if you heard about it. Uh, no, what is it? Oh, I think uh, it might go up in flames. OK. There's this yeah. famous YouTuber who uh -huh. uh, made a very nice video about it. Did he make it catch on fire? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was uh, okay. very nice to watch. Yeah, we made this adapter. So for people who don't have a PSU that natively can support 12 volt high power and who don't want to use some weird NVIDIA adapter, because yeah. they, I mean, they usually work. Yeah. They don't catch uh, fi on fire, but they just look ugly because they hang down on your card with like four pins. Right. And with this, you can just plug it into the card and have like three eight pins going to the back. Mm. What I usually find um, also entertaining to talk about is the power ratings. Yeah. Because this is rated for 600. Uh, Let's start with the card. So yeah. the 4090, I think, officially is a 450 watt. Like on paper, stock, yes, yeah, stock, yeah. And then if you have the FE model, at least it allows you to go up to officially 600 watts. Uh, in our testing, we were seeing anywhere from if it's Fermark Power Virus, 600 to 660 watts or so. Uh, yeah. And then obviously any additional overclocking. I mean, if you're modding the BIOS or something, it's, it's kind of a different scenario. But yeah, uh, and I think the connector is rated for 720 watts, mm -hmm. if I remember yeah. correctly. I don't remember if it was at 9 amps per pin. We Something could, like we that. We could do the math, or we could yeah. just not. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 720 watt. But then usually the NVIDIA connector has four times eight pin, mm. which is total overkill. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, the, yeah. the eight pin, they are usually used for 150 watt. But the, the actual connector rating is so much higher. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we o extreme overclocked cards that I don't know. They were pulling like uh, 1,500 watt out of like three pins. Yeah. Uh, at three, three times Connectors, eight pins. Yeah. yeah. Well, so on this one, the interesting thing with the 12 watt high power stuff, um, when we did some initial testing, and we were the only ones who did this, but we severed, I think it was all of the pins except for one at one point. And we pushed all the power through one pin, and it still yeah. wouldn't melt yeah. when it was mounted properly. Uh, and then we also did a test on a Sun Moon SM8800, it's like a load testing unit, and an SM220. And I don't remember the how, how much power we ended up pulling through it. It was like over 1,000 watts through, through the cable, and it was completely fine. So there's were some of the initial testing we did, uh, which led eventually to us figuring out how to at least melt it in one scenario, which was the loose contact problem. Mm -hmm. And the loose contact problem, I think, feeds into the design oversight we talked about in the original video, where it's like, if you mount this thing perfectly to a load tester and run whatever crazy wattage through it, it's fine. Or if you snap pins, it's fine. But as soon as you go and manage your cable behind the case and it wiggles a little bit, like that's where it's that mix of problems. So. I think it's also quite hard. Sometimes I think people forget about it, but it's um, it's always something different, like making a product, mm. like developing, testing something, and then having actual mass production. Like, right. It's obviously the the thing the like user is testing. Yeah. But that's the way it is because if you make a connector like this, you have certain tolerances on the connector, mm. then you have like accessories, cables that have certain tolerances right. to them. And then imagine you make like one million of that cable and one million of that connector, and then you will find out if there was a problem or not. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, it, it, it's different if you make, let's, let's say you tested 1,000 pieces, you might not even find and the even problem. That's kind of a lot, it's like for yeah. testing, I mean. Yeah. So it's not yeah. sufficient, obviously, but yeah. a lot in terms of maybe NVIDIA goes that high, but I sincerely doubt most comp like cable companies, yeah. I doubt they test 1,000. Yeah, units, of course not. You know? And I. Don't get me wrong, I don't want to defend NVIDIA right here before you kill me uh, on the connector. I'm not a big fan of that connector, to, to make it clear. Yeah, and I'm not um, either, and I, I think people do lose the plot with yeah. that. Yeah. But, but still, I can see that sometimes those things cannot be caught in mm. like the development process. You will only see it uh, during mass production sometimes. So that's it for this one. It's an abrupt end here because we, after this, immediately branched into the thermal conductivity rant, which is already live on the channel, so you can check that out. But otherwise, that wraps up some of Der Bauer's new products, and we have several of those in-house now, so uh, we're planning to work with Wireview. It looks actually really cool. There's some neat features to it. So we'll check all that out. And as always, thanks for watching this completely unscripted video with Roman where we just meandered through a bunch of engineering topics. Really educational for us to do these. I love doing these types of videos. It's great learning about things like 
uh, liquid metal, plating, other different types of metals and all that stuff. Subscribe for more. Go over to Roman's channel at Der Bauer. He has an English channel as well. And we'll see you all next time.